and we're here today to present the fiscal condition of the city. Um, this presentation is intended to provide the framework utilized to construct the city's proposed budget. By now, you should have all received uh, copies of the mayor's proposed budget, um, and we will have subsequent departmental uh, uh, meetings to take deeper dives into each department's allocation. Uh, before we start, I would like to acknowledge CEO Gordon, uh, Chief of Staff Donald and their staff, as well as Chairman Juan uh, for their guidance and leadership uh, during the development process. I would also like to thank uh, Deputy Wilson, uh, Chief Davis, and the revenue team, Chief Bell, and the uh, bu entire budget team, Deputy Carr, uh, and the controllers team, and everybody in finance who's helped uh, throughout this effort. Um, if you look at the agenda during today's presentation, I will cover the economic outlook. Deputy Wilson will cover the revenue projections. Uh, CEO Gordon will discuss the operating budget developments. Uh, Chief Davis will address uh, revenues. Chief Bell will highlight the expenditures. Uh, Deputy Carr will give an overview on trust funds, impact fees, as well as fund balance. And finally, Deputy Wilson will uh, pitch in for Chief Knight, who couldn't make it today, and cover the uh, debt and investments. Uh, so if you will, can you please go to slide four? Um, CFO Ball, if you let me real quickly, I want to uh, announce that we've been joined by Council Members Howard Shook, Byron Amos, and Dustin Hillis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, in this slide, on a macro level, the economy is entering into a new phase uh, on a path to recovery as we continue to ease restrictions and have significant improvements in vaccination rates as well as reductions in hospitalizations. GDP um, is expected to grow at 4% this year, and that's despite the slight uh, contraction we saw in the first quarter. Uh, GDP passed its pre-COVID peak in the second quarter of 21, and we're anticipating a full recovery of, of lost jobs nationally by 2023. Slide five, please. Again, uh, nationally, our economy is rebounding as impacts of the pandemic waned. Uh, despite the surge in Delta variant and supply chain issues, the economy continued to expand. Um, on a state and, 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 and local levels, we saw revenue collections that held up pretty strong during the uh, pandemic. And therefore, much of the federal support allowed state and local governments to fund one-time use, uses to really help citizens and businesses during the recovery. Um, the major factors in the economy will be consumer spending and, and job growth. Those are, are kind of big levers going into 23. Slide six, please. Um, while consumer spending and housing continue to be strong drivers of the economy, we continue to monitor Fed policy to address inflationary concerns. So even as of yesterday, there was another interest rate hike, and uh, the federal chairman did say that they will continue to monitor inflation but not be as aggressive as they once had thought they would be. And if you look at the markets the last couple of days, they've been uh, volatile and as people assess and address those, uh, that information. Um, next slide, please. With, with, with uh, regards to Atlanta, we still con continue to attract top employers. We are the number three, uh, third most Fortune 500 companies headquartered in our region. Our region is expected to have 1.9 million jobs to be created by 2040. And we benefit from the world's busiest airport here at Atlanta, uh, Hartsfield-Jackson. And we're also the number three market for educational attainment. Um, on slide eight, you know, Atlanta continues to be an economic engine that is not dependent on one industry. So if you can see the diversity in our uh, sectors, we are not, um, that diversity really plays into our strength. And, and you see some of the sectors that are highlighted here. Next slide, please. Um, Atlanta continues to be one of the highest growing MSAs in the nation. Our region lost 13.6% uh, 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 jobs due to COVID and 
85% of those jobs have already been recovered, and we expect to add another 100,000 jobs by the end of 2022, which is a 3.6% increase. Uh, savings are expected to decline to 7% from a high of 16% in 2020, and that's really due to less federal household support that was infused into many homes during the pandemic. Uh, housing sales, we expect to continue to be strong, but will slow down as home prices continue to increase. Slide 10, please. Um, as mentioned before, Atlanta's strength continues to be its economic diversity. Our main industries, construction and distribution, are expected to outperform the overall economy. We continue to have infrastructure challenges and look forward to addressing those needs through federal, state, and local support. Um, and as mentioned before, that job growth is a key driver into FY23 assumptions and is something that we uh, continue to monitor. But in closing, I just want to say that uh, we are cautiously optimistic for FY23. Um, to date, FY22 has been extremely strong, and we are outpacing our projections in FY22. Um, but this budget year is one where we can take a little bit uh, more um, solace in, in, in lifting some of the conservative assumptions that were put in FY22. We uh, have a, a, a strong, robust budget. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Deputy Wilson, who will go over the revenue projections and how they were constructed. Actually, see if I, if, if I might hit the pause button. So we're going to just stop at each one of the sections and see if there are any questions or, or remarks from my colleagues. I am going to jump in real quick. So um, uh, there is some talk, as you talked about the broader markets and economic forecasts, um, of, the, of a possibility of a recession next year. Um, again, given the volati volatility around oil prices, inflation, and all that. Um, in your from your perspective, in terms of if there is a national uh, recession, how insulated or how how correlated is the Atlanta economy to that? Um, are we are we less volatile, more volatile, or, or pretty much in line? So that uh, you know, if that does come about, um, what can we expect? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think the Atlanta economy is less volatile given the diversity of our, of our sectors, and for our budget for FY23, the core revenue drivers, which are sales tax, uh, uh, lost uh, revenue, uh, as well as some of the um, business license revenues, we anticipate to hold and be strong despite uh, any recessionary um, pressures. Um, so we feel that we are more insulated, but we know we're still something to monitor and continue to assess on a you know monthly basis. And I have to admit I haven't been following closely what the, the anticipation is. Those that are saying that we might be um, uh, susceptible to a recession if it is you know if first, second, or third, fourth quarter of 2023. I think it's later in the year if I recall, but I could be. Um, that that is correct. Okay. Yep. All right. Other questions from my colleagues, just on kind of general macroeconomic uh, uh, what uh, CFO Ball just presented. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Tina Wilson, Deputy CFO. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we uh, came came about with the revenue projections. Um, this has been a uh, lengthy exercise, thorough exercise. We again engaged with Deloitte to work with us. Um, because of the volatility that uh, was was COVID. Um, so they have worked with us for the last several years. Um, and so on our first slide, number 12, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how the, uh, we built those economic scenarios with uh, expertise and, and economists from Deloitte, our own internal uh, e um, subject matter ex experts, as well as uh, our internal forecasting models utilizing some of the macroeconomic trends uh, that CFO Bala talked about at the national, state, and local level, as well as uh, our historical revenues and analyzing those uh, revenues in a city-specific manner, uh, whether it be parking citations and uh, administrative orders, executive orders that, that were in place. Uh, we analyzed those general fund revenue levers, and you'll see the major revenue categories that uh, make up the general fund. And then finally, we aggregated those assumptions into a revenue model. Um, those scenarios were developed for each revenue lever, 
um, specific to, to each uh, major category. And the scenario output was using the calendar year 2019 and 2022 data as a baseline. Uh, the result was uh, three uh, scenarios, uh, high, medium, and low. And if we'll go to slide 13. Uh, Deloitte recommended and we accepted the medium growth scenario, which assumes medium economic growth. New vaccines and treatments are still being developed, but COVID variants continue to affect health to a lesser degree. Uh, consumer spending continues to increase as people continue to become a little more comfortable uh, going out, using services, uh, going to restaurants, and so forth. Um, employment growth continues to increase. Uh, we, we are aware and uh, are watching closely the supply chain issues that, that continue and continue to uh, monitor GDP growth. <clears throat> uh, the medium scenario uh, lands on a uh, revenue amount of $730 million. Next slide. So in tying the macroeconomic trends to revenues, we, we take a lessened economic impact from COVID with an increased economic activity and growth and get to um, some major revenue categories with increased um, increased revenues. Now the COVID, COVID continues to evolve with new variants and rising cases. Um, however, it's combated by vaccines, boosters, and other therapeutics that are, that are now available and, and more readily available to the public. Um, our increased economic growth activity, of course, factors in GDP, inflation, which we know is um, is, is imminent and uh, impacting us currently uh, and will continue, as well as consumer spending and residential real, est real estate. <clears throat> Again, supply chain issues, um, but unemployment rates are on the decline. So the latest macroeconomic trends show and support economic growth on an upward trajectory um, towards pre-pandemic levels. Next slide. So we have a table here that itemizes our uh, major revenue categories, what were some of the drivers, and how it impacted the city um, in comparison from 2019. In our property taxes, we've seen housing prices and, and commercial real estate prices increase, which have, have had a positive impact on uh, the city of Atlanta's property tax revenue. The local option sales tax, uh, we've definitely seen a uh, continued uh, growth in our sales tax, um, not nearly impacted as we would have initially expected from COVID, as people have continued to, to spend, whether it's, it's now online. Um, our public utility, alcoholic beverages, and other, uh, we've seen insurance premiums grow, um, and public utility revenue uh, remain the same, so positive impact um, for the city of Atlanta. For licenses and permits, we've seen businesses um, submitting 39.5 million in late payments during calendar year 2021. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a later slide um, as it relates to more deferred revenue as opposed to a decline in revenue. And the alcohol and pouring license revenue um, is still in 2021 with 77% of calendar year 19. Of course, we know that, that there was impacts with um, stay-at-home orders and um, business, business closures during that time period. All other revenue, the, the major category impacted there was hotel, motel tax. Um, hotel occupancy was, is 5% below pre-COVID levels, but we are seeing that rebound. And fines, forfeitures, and fees, um, mainly the pre-trial intervention revenue uh, being a major factor that's 43% below pre-COVID, but again, we're, we are starting to see that turn around as well. Next slide. This slide really is um, designed to show you uh, as a comparison, the FY22, where our actuals and projections um, at the end of the fiscal year um, are expected to end at 728 million, compared to the low, medium, and high range um, and the medium scenario at 730.2 million. And you can see those each by uh, major category. If we'll go to the next slide, you see those same revenue categories, but with a little bit more uh, historical data. 
um, as a reference. This is a num numerical depiction, um, and the next slide we'll, we'll see a, a graphical depiction. But while we're here, uh, historical revenue, um, our actuals at 694.2, and then of course COVID impact at 681 in 2020, and then in 2021, 642.7. This excludes our, uh, any federal funds. And then in FY22, the 728.1 million, um, again, we see an uh, unexpected rebound in FY22. Next slide. As I stated, this is uh, more of a graphical depiction of that same information. Uh, we'll have a, a dashed line for the actual adjusted for inflation. But I'll draw your attention to the orange line, which is the medium scenario um, that carries you out for a, a few outer years as well. Um, and it's consistent with our five-year plan that we presented to FEC a few weeks ago. On the next slide, and, and over the next several slides, we'll dive into a little bit more detail uh, across those major revenue streams. But beginning with property taxes, these are the amounts levied on all real, personal, and public utility property within the corporate limits of, of the city. Property taxes make up a substantial base of the city's municipal revenues, uh, just over 30%, and they're less sensitive to the near-term economic shock caused by the coronavirus. Tax revenues are highly dependent on Atlanta's property values, which, which as we know, have been rising. And in the chart to the top right, you'll see a slight dip in FY 2023. This is due mainly to a projected reduction in intangible recording tax revenue. Um, that's a result of anticipated increases in, in interest rates and the cost of borrowing. Uh, the intangible recording tax is uh, payable on each instrument securing a long-term note like a, like a mortgage. Also, there's a projected decline in the real estate transfer tax as there is a shortage of available housing inventory. Real estate transfer taxes are levied on the sale of um, or transfer of real estate. Next slide. Our local option sales tax are taxes imposed on the purchase, sale, rental, storage, use, or consumption of tangible personal property and related services. Local option sales tax is the second largest component of the general fund, accounting for roughly 18%. And we expect sales revenue to continue favorably as we've not seen any significant impact due to the pandemic. Uh, quite the contrary, uh, consumer spending has been robust, yet we will continue to monitor purchasing patterns in the short term as inflation is a major factor. In the longer term, we expect the sales revenue to follow trends related to consumer spending, GDP growth, personal disposable income, and fixed business investments. Next slide. License and permits revenue includes general business or occupational license tax, various parking and building permits, and occupancy certificates. License and permits account for about 16% of municipal revenues, and business licenses alone make up over half of this revenue stream. And the timing of when licenses are due at the administrative, that, uh, administrative orders that were in place and in FY21 to delay penalties and interest for late filing explain the dip in FY21 in the chart on the top right. Uh, this course correction is reflected in FY22 as you see that spike back up and we expect a return to a more normalized level in FY23. Other permits related to construction activity were not significantly impacted by COVID. Next slide. Our public utility, alcoholic beverages, and other uh, are taxes for public utilities, motor vehicles, and titles, uh, state railroads, insurance premiums, and wholesale and uh, buy the drink alcoholic beverages. It accounts for about 17% of the general fund. Almost half of this revenue stream is comprised of the public utility franchise, which we do not expect to be impacted uh, based on longstanding contracts and lengthy timelines to re renegotiate such contracts. In the long term, we expect this revenue stream to be mostly driven by GDP and consumer spending. Next slide. 
fines, forfeitures, and penalties. Our revenue comprised primarily of traffic fines and, and forfeitures. Uh, as you all may, may recall, the parking enforcement um, administrative order was lifted, so we are seeing recovery there as, um, within parking as well as having the courts back in session. Next slide. And finally, all other revenues, uh, the, the biggest portion of other revenues is indirect cost recoveries, which account for 33%. This impact is held constant in the short term as the costs are charged over a two-year lag based on audited results and are a function of the overall size of government. Pilot and franchise fees, like water and sewer, are also uh, not heavily impacted as these are considered essential services that have historically been resilient to economic shocks. Hotel tax revenue obviously took a sharp hit during the pandemic as travel cratered due to shelter-in-place restrictions, but we've seen a significant return to this sector uh, nearing pre-COVID levels. In the long term, the, this overall revenue stream is linked to GDP and consumer spending. In the chart on the top right, you'll, you'll notice a spike in 21, and this is um, related to the ARP funds that we received the first tranche in uh, fiscal year 21 for. All right, if um, I might pause real quick, I want to recognize that we've been joined by Councilmember Antonio Lewis, um, and then I'll open it up for questions um, on uh, the section regarding revenue. Ms. Overstreet. I have a quick question. It doesn't really apply to the budget this time, but I was looking at um, slide 19, and it breaks down the property tax uh, according to residential and non-residential, and we're at 52% um, and 48%. And I was just wondering what kind of trends we usually have for the city. I think this is the first time I actually noticed that number. Um, is that usually the ratio that we have? And um, like, if we go back five or ten years, is this? Are we still on the same trend? And what is a danger zone? You know, like, would that be um, too much residential, not enough non-residential? I mean, just explain that to me just a little bit. So I think the breakdown between residential and non-residential is pretty consistent and has been for the last several years. When we get into the, the revenue slides, uh, Chief Davis has a, a further breakdown with a smaller percentage towards the industrial um, and another, uh, one other category. But the, the trend has typically been about that split. We, we would anticipate that it would be about the same. Um, we are obviously seeing more commercial uh, building going on. And, and that's why I'm asking, um, just talking about you know, rooftops and development. I'm just trying to see how that affects our budget. Yeah. Yeah, we would expect to see, see the same trend um, continue. Um, even with the commercial properties that are being built, they are, they are mainly residential um, properties that are going up. So from a permitting standpoint, that, that tends to be where, where the, uh, the ratio is going to continue out in the, in the outer years as well. And that's what we would expect to see. Okay, that was the only question that just popped in my mind. Yeah, and, and the, the breakdown that's in front of you is the FY19 breakdown, and it's, it's consistent in that 50-50 split between uh, residential and non-residential. And Ms. Overstreet, I mean, this, this also opens up a conversation. It assumes that the value, the properties are properly assessed and valued in terms of the tax digest, and I know that there's been some conversation out there about whether that is actually the case, yeah. both on the residential and commercial side. And that is not our purview. That will be the county, right? If they do the assessments, that is correct. So, but we certainly, <laughs> but we certainly can influence that. And, um, I've, and some of us have been looking at the commercial undervaluation for many years because they have very high-powered lawyers. They have the ability to come down to whether to us or the county and um, make their case in a way that a typical homeowner is, does not have that same technical capacity and financial capacity to do. So it is something for us to look at going okay. forward because our homeowners are paying tremendous amounts of property taxes, um, mostly to the school board. Um, I had a question. Uh, Ms. Norwood, I do have a queue already. Um, that I'm, I've got a list of folks going on, so I'll add you to the list. If that's okay? The list? Yep. Um, where, we've, been where do I by, sign up? we've been joining, <laughs> uh, joined by Councilmember Bakhtiari, um, and I've got 
Councilmember Hillis, then Shook, then Lewis, then Norwood. So Hillis, you, are, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman Warren. The question I have is on the key drivers and impacts of revenue. So we see we're up in three, we're down in three. I can, uh, we know while we're down in the all other revenue, the hotels, they're not occupied due to COVID. Uh, fines and forfeitures are down because of the same. You know, I can pick on the courts when they get here as to what they're going to do to fix that. Uh, but licenses and permits, uh, that's an issue that has been um, on what, what are we going to, um, you know, it says here businesses submitted $39.5 million in late payments during calendar year 21. I'm assuming that is on us because of the issues with the systems. And I have people contacting me, um, and I've followed up with them, like, hey, are you still ab been able to submit your, um, you know, we have people wanting to give, give money to the city. Um, so person that has two businesses, so I, I asked for an update from them, said, yes, I was finally allowed to submit my payment for 21. I filed for 22, but I'm still waiting on an invoice. On the other business, I can't even get them to issue an invoice for 21, and the system will not let me pay 2022 until that's resolved. Um, and it also has, um, they also mentioned um, they have someone listed as an officer that is near, uh, is no longer an officer. So where are we at with fixing this system so people can please give us money <laughs> that, that the city is due that they want to pay? So, yes, we're, we're um, keenly aware of the challenges with uh, license renewals, and, and there have been um, some things that have been stood, stood up in order to uh, alleviate some of the angst from customers, like the administrative orders from last year that gave people more time to renew. We have had some system challenges, um, and people have experienced that we know that people have experienced. So in order to address some of that, we said, well, we will extend the, the, the deadline. So in calendar year 21, we gave customers the entire year to renew 2021. And then in um, 2022, we have also done some similar actions to delay any sort of late fees and, and penalties and, and so forth as we work through the backlog of people trying to renew. Um, there are some challenges with people getting um, into the system using an email. Maybe they've, they've forgotten the email or the person is no longer there. Um, so we, t we have to build a case. They usually will call 311 and we will um, assign a case and then work through that case log. So there are um, some deliberate actions in place in order for us to whittle down the, the um, the renewal season, as it as it happens, um, we are at I think it's 80, 85 percent of um, the renewals for 2022. Uh, one of the and I think you you uh, mentioned it was when you have a multi-year renewal. So if someone, it especially gets prompted when there's um, when people are applying for grants and so forth, and they'll come and say, "Well, I need to uh, renew my 22." Well, then it things come up about, well, we need to renew 2020 or 2021 first before we can renew 2022. And that takes a little bit more um, effort in the Office of Revenue because we have to review financial statements and get additional documentation from customers. So it does take a little bit longer time. Um, but we are, we are aware and we are working diligently um, through trying to get uh, that case log down. Thank you. Yeah, and I also, just to mention, I want to um, acknowledge Chief Davis and his leadership since he's uh, joined uh, joined us in finance. This year we have significantly uh, improved recoveries. In fact, that deferred revenue uh, that uh, Deputy Wilson was talking about last year is contributing to a, uh, a significant backlog reduction. So we're, we're seeing we're seeing the money come in real time, and we are um, collecting many, much of that revenue from 2020, 2021 this year. So it's helping our bottom line significantly, and uh, we'll be happy to, to, to share that information with you. But you can see it in the charts that kind of big spike in the 22 uh, collections. 
All right, we've been joined also by Council Member Jason Dozier. Next up is Shook, followed by Lewis. Uh, okay, thank you. Two questions. Um, in terms of fines and forfeitures, your projection for FY23 is kind of close to double FY21 actuals. And I understand the, the wish, the hope that because the courts have reopened, we'll get back. But, I mean, e even these projections based on, you know, full court operations are still 25% below where they were pre-pandemic when the courts were open. So help me out. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we were conservative with that approach. There is uh, much more impetus that's being put into pre-trial diversion, and uh, we are, of course, being less punitive in the charges that, that they're, they're assessing. So those are some of the factors that we're, we're also uh, considering. But we do not want to be uh, overly optimistic in this category just because of where we're where we were in FY21 and where 22 is shaping up, so we're projecting next year to be a little bit over uh, FY22's actuals. But um, it was a, a conscious decision to be a little conservative with this revenue category. Okay. License and permits revenue. Um, why are the medium and low scenarios? essentially indistinguishable and, and both are as flat as they are. Um, again, um, for, for this category for license and, and permits, which is primarily uh, driven by general business licenses, they are uh, calculated licenses based on business operations. And so, uh, you know, every, people end up having to apply for a business license, we are not going to see uh, a significant increase uh, year over year in those categories. I mean, the, there's not going to be much difference in between a lot and a high case scenario. It's just a matter of executing and making sure that we hit the 16,000 or so businesses that um, are eligible for renewal annually. And there's not much difference in the in the assumptions that's made in um, in those business license renewals, other than we know that there's a timing issue between um, when people were able to renew from 21, 22, and now into 23. So, so the assumptions behind that di didn't really differ between the no low and medium because we know the challenges with people trying to renew. Okay. Well, and then last question related to that: Have those bugs been worked out, or are there still problems? We're, we're still in communications with the um, with the vendor about some of the challenges that um, still exist within the system. This is an ongoing conversation we've been having um, since uh, launch of last year, um, and there are still some uh, configurations that they're still working through. Um, but we are in constant communication with trying to uh, whittle down the, the issues and concerns that you, we get feedback from you all, from the customers as well. Yeah, I'm sure you hear from us as... Uh Water rolls downhill. Thank you. All right, next up is Lewis, followed by Norwood. And, and my question was surrounding around, uh, I know last year we lost some funds. They went back to the federal government. Uh, my, my, goal, my question was, is there a way in which you could tell us about lose it or use it funds that may come down from federal or, or, or projects like the Recovery Act and stuff like that? Could you inform us about that before we lose it this year? Or, or, is, or is there some that we're about to lose right now? Um, so to answer that question, um, in this uh, overview that was given today, these are the general fund revenue categories. The grant funds that come in coming to separate grant-associated funds, uh, we'd be happy to kind of have a further dialogue about where grant funds stand. But uh, under uh, Commissioner uh, Lonin's leadership, we are uh, exceeding all those benchmarks and hurdles to assure that the city will not lose any grant funds this year. And we have constructed a process in place with 
uh, her team, finance team, as well as the law team, to make sure that grant process for the city is an efficient process and one which we are um, dispersing on time and collecting on time and coordinating with the um, grant recipients as well to make sure that they're dotting their I's and crossing their T's to make sure that their packages are complete for submittal so that those timing lags could be addressed. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Bala. You've been it's extremely accessible to me since I've, I've got elected. I appreciate you with that answer right there as well. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Ms. Norwood, followed by Mr. Winston. Yes, my question is about alcohol by the drink. Um, I know we've had issues, and when I was investigating this about two years ago, uh, I called a distributor that I know personally, and I said, why can't we get the amount of money that y'all that is collected from these bars uh, for their alcohol and then be able to extrapolate how much they should be paying in, in uh, liquor by the drink? And he said, Mary, they don't buy it from us because they pay no taxes. They buy it from the package store down the street, and they come in a bunch of people at the same time. So my question to you is, what are y'all doing to figure out how many bars we've got and what's an appropriate amount of money that we should be collecting from them? And what are we doing if you... I mean, we know we have bad actors, and we know the mayor's doing the new nightlife division, but I was stunned and went to a very indis uh, insignificant little liquor store, and I said, is this happening to you? And they said, Ms. Norwood, we have to sell it to them. They come in there. We don't know if they're having a private party or not, and they come in and demand to pick up all this whiskey. And, and if they're paying no tax, it's cheaper than doing wholesale and paying tax on liquor by the drink and alcohol that you've purchased. So my question is, what is being put in place to go after that? I know the police department, et cetera, but what are y'all seeing? Is that 9.2% appropriate for the amount of bars and establishments that we have? We have um, set up a process by which um, we, work, we are working closely with APD. Um, they are uh, great partners in helping us establish uh, those entities that are claiming to be restaurants and or bars. And at that point, we can request financial information that they report how much is a food sale versus an alcohol sale. And under that analysis, we can tell, are you selling more alcohol than food and you're really a bar and not a restaurant and then we can, we can communicate back to APD in their code enforcement side to go and have a look at that location and um, cite them, et cetera, and enforce the, the, the rules in which that, that they can. Um, but from our perspective, we can look at the financial information um, and have the purview to do that under the charter to review um, how much they're reporting for food versus alcohol sales. Okay, and, and so do y'all communicate with the Georgia Department of Revenue on how many um, establishments in Atlanta are purchasing through the various distributors? There aren't that many in Georgia. We're, we're actually in the process now of establishing a relationship with the Georgia Department of Revenue because they have to also issue a alcohol license um, and receive information from them so we can coalesce around a process in order to get information from them that will help us identify um, all of the, the uh, restaurants and bars that have been issued an alcohol license and ensure that the city also has the same set of information, the same alcohol licenses have been issued that the state issued that are within the city. So it is a partnership that we are in the process of developing with the Department of Revenue. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Norwood, uh, Mr. Winston, and then Mr. Dozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question pertains to the uh, public utility alcohol beverage category. Um, we're seeing a significant increase in that category in terms of revenue um, starting um, in the new fiscal year. As, but it's also, you know, we could see that pre-pandemic levels, it was pretty low. I see that the public utility revenue um, is going to remain flat for the next couple of years. So I'm just trying to see what's the significant driver in, in the increase of revenue in this category. Uh, the 
part of the main factor there is uh, on the public utility side, this is where you will have our um, Georgia Powers of, of the world. Um, but on the alcohol side as well, this is where we're seeing the, the recovery for um, restaurants and bars reopening. And we're expecting and, those to be above pre-pandemic levels? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And then people are thirsty coming out of the pandemic. All right, Jay Doe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, just had a quick question about property taxes. For the housing prices, does that include multifamily or is multifamily being counted with commercial? In, in residential, yes. Okay, so it's being counted as residential? Okay. Um, that was really it. I just wanted to kind of know the rents are going up as high as these single family properties. And oftentimes it gets caught in that commercial, especially for mixed use properties, it gets weird in terms of how that is evaluated. So I was just curious about that since commercial hasn't gone up commercial with housing. So thank you. That's it. Any other questions on the revenue section? All right. Um, if y'all will proceed to the next one. Thank you. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Gordon, Chief Operating Officer for the City of Atlanta. Um, I just wanted to thank the Council for an opportunity to share with you the uh, objectives for our FY23 budget. And I also wanted to thank CFO Bala and his entire team. They've been working very hard um, on this budget and uh, very collaborative with the administration and with all the departments. Um, if you look at the first slide, you can see some of our development objectives. And I think today was a reminder of the importance of maintaining uh, public safety and our service delivery And we ha as we had officers shot in the line of duty. Um, protecting our community. Um, that officer is doing well, um, recovering, and uh, just wanted to share that with you. Um, as it relates to uh, post-COVID recovery, we know that we want to see equitable growth in our community. I know that's a shared goal with the City Council. And then also as we look at that equity, it turns into um, catalyzing social and economic mobility. So it's important for us to have investments in our community across uh, different areas, and you'll see that reflected in the budget. And most important, um, being a CPA fellow uh, finance person here, maintaining strong financial position, healthy fund balance reserves, and really great fiscal stewardship um, around how we invest and uh, utilize our funds for City of Atlanta. The next slide. So if you look at our increases, they're really um, in, in a few areas. One is um, investments in our people. We know how important it is to retain and recruit employees, and especially on the front line. And during COVID, we saw that more importantly. So you'll see um, front line uh, staff increases for 311, for FIRE, for AIM, for ATL DOT, and for the Parks Department. One of the other most important things that I think this budget reflects is a COLA for all employees that were not addressed in the wage increases, and that's the first COLA since 2017. It's only five years. So we look at a tight labor market. It's important for us to make sure our wages are competitive, and we'll be doing more work on that in, the, in this um, coming year as well. Infrastructure investments are important for the foundation of our community, especially as we look at our parks, our police and fire stations. We know that there are issues that need to be addressed, and I think in this budget, as well as in other initiatives on capital infrastructure um, and the up upcoming bonds, you will see that investment being prioritized by the administration. Our youth need pathways to productive activities and our at promise youth centers investments um, kick in this year where we're sharing the cost of that um, program with the Atlanta Police Foundation and we're continuing to expand the At Promise Youth Centers. Increased funding for arts and culture is important to our community as we connect, especially coming out of COVID. We feel that that's an investment that allows us to reconnect with each other. Most importantly, and I know most of you have heard me talk about that, is our commitment to efficient, effective, excellent government. And how do we improve our constituent experience, especially through our 311? So as we discussed earlier, we have to invest in our people. We are evaluating our processes to fine tune them and refine them. And then we're making investments in technology so that our technology has the functionality that we need to be effective in the delivery of service uh, to our community. The next slide shows the summary 
and we talked about those priorities. If you look at them, you can see where um, the public safety investments is um, they're the key changes. So it's about six million dollars. Our equitable wages is about three point two million dollars. Our frontline workers um, investments one point seven million. The arts increase is about a half million, and our, our at promise youth centers is one point eight million. As we talked about, it's really important for us to maintain our reserves, and uh, there's some additional investments. And so that really shows that priority, not just by what we say, but by what we do and how we invest in the FY23 budget. Next, you're going to see the expense breakout. And again, this is if you add this slide up, starting from the 46 all the way up to the 343, you see the categories. And again, as we prioritize um, public safety, you're seeing that that is the highest investment. Um, there's a significant gap between you get to administration, which is our other departments, and then non-departmental, those expenses that we're required to pay. And they happen whether we want them to or not. So uh, then our independent groups is just our OIG, audit, judicial, um, ACRB, and um, those entities that are independent from the administration, but they're critical to the work that we do. Next slide. So operational areas of focus is where do we intend to spend our time, energies, um, as it relates to public safety, it's reducing crime. We want our communities to be safe, and we're doing everything that we can to make sure that happens. Increasing our youth employment engagement, having pathways for youth to be successful, especially in some of our communities where we know there is disinvestment, it's important for us to have programs that engage our youth in productive activities. Near and dear to my heart is affordable housing and economic mobility. We know we have a housing need. We see the increases discussed in the previous sections, and we know only economic mobility uh, in our community will provide equity. Reducing unsheltered homelessness. We know this is an issue that plagues every community across our nation, and it is a priority of the administration to find new solutions that leverage some of the investments that we've already made, and this budget reflects that. Increasing satisfaction with city services. Again, we want to be an excellent uh, city government that has services that our constituents um, value and feel are efficient and effective. And our investment in infrastructure is Really, I, I think it's, it's replacement of uh, infrastructure, renovations, as well as what are the things we should be doing so we can be a city of the future. Um, so that in investment in infrastructure is critical. If you look at the other budget priorities, this just has to do with what's happening with personnel. You'll see that public safety recruitment is a focus of the administration. We have that goal of recruiting for 250 officers by the end of the year. We are well on our way to um, meeting that target. Uh, but it is an ongoing issue because as many officers as we hire, we have officers that retire. And so there are things that we are looking at um, to stem the tide on um, that retention. And so those numbers um, can be a net increase that, that we all can be proud of. Uh, we have hiring and, and retention in the tight labor market. We talked about the COLA. We talked about wage increases. And also we'll be looking at ways to um, leverage the staff that we have. Our FTE position counts for departments will be reflected in the budget, and you'll get a personnel paper preview in an upcoming session. This last slide that I'm looking at just shows you where the FTEs are, and you can see across departments um, where we have funded and filled and vacant. And in this labor market, it's been really um, tough in terms of recruitment. So um, I think the more things that we can do to make our government and how we run efficient and effective, the more that we can retain people and the more that we can have people um, want to see the city of Atlanta as an employee, employee of choice. So certainly that is a focus of the administration. Um, and that concludes my presentation. All right. Thank you, CEO Gordon. Um, we've got uh, Shook, then Bakhtiari, then Winston Dozier. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, per Arts and culture investments, um, a request of the administration, could you provide us <clears throat> with the total spending as opposed to the single line item that is always seized upon by the very passionate and organized arts community and their followers, okay. which they then use as a basis for, you know, proving that we spend 12% of what Charlotte spends. But, but if you look at all the different revenue streams, 
we're competitive. So please save us all and, and give us that total number. Thank you. Okay. All right, Councilmember, back to you. Hey, everybody. Um, I have a list of questions. I'm going to start with the top of what we discussed. So the wage increases for frontline staff. Um, 311, uh, I was curious, and this might come off topic a bit, but um, right now, as, as far as I know, we have each of the department that pays into 301s, correct? Yes, uh, there's a general fund contribution to 311, as well as uh, Department of Watershed Management and uh, Department of uh, Solid Waste Enterprise that contribute to 311. So um, now that our 311 call staff is all H A H M I S certified and they're beginning to take things off of 911's plate would it not make sense for APD to also pay into that fund um, I think the uh, leadership at 311 is mm -hmm. continuing to have dialogue with uh, with APD and E911 to see what type of support and at which level those supports could be okay. um, and if they uh, kind of come to an agreement there could be mechanisms into which uh, funding could be distributed, mm -hmm. but we're still in the kind of discussion phases, and so uh, I'm sure uh, leadership with you and one will, you know, continue to dialogue with, with council during their FEC up, uh, updates and quarterly updates to see where, they're, where they are with, with regards to that initiative. Thank you. And that being said, will we also be able to get funding from the municipal court system to also go into 311, given the work that they're doing? Well, with municipal courts, um, their funding is also general fund mm -hmm. funded. So, you know, that would be part of the general fund allocation to 311. Okay. Because I would think with their familiar faces program and everything they're trying to do to supposedly tackle things from a more holistic perspective yeah. that they would... Yeah, I think I think I think the you know, we had we had a conversation with three one one leadership. The right thing to do is to look at their service delivery on an annual basis mm -hmm. and kind of see where the need and the support from three one one is going, so that it's equitably distributed between the various uh, funds. Thank you, um, and happy to see that we're talking about cola. Uh, do we have any idea of how that would be implemented and when? Sure. Um, so our proposed budget um, has an assumption of a 2% COLA mm -hmm. starting on January 1st of 2023. And we ended our step, in when did we end our step increase program? We had that some years ago, did we not? Um, I have to provide that information. Um, I don't want to say off the top of the head, but... Okay. Um, I will, I, we could confirm when the last step increase was to provide that information. Thank you. And we still have many questions to go. Save a bottle if you want to take a sip of water. <laughs> um, the increased funding for arts and culture, uh, happy to hear that given that for every dollar we see a $4 return on what we spend in the arts, mostly from our local arts, not so much the larger arts organizations such as the Woodruff and the High, which tend to take a majority of funding. Um, I'm curious as if one will be growing the department and how that funding will be diversified. Are we looking at an arts district? Are we looking at, we, do we still have the, one of the lowest arts budgets in the country? Um, is half of our funding still coming from the NEA? I'm curious about that. I think we should get you that information because those are a bunch of detailed questions. I know there's um, a focus on how we invest in the arts, how we leverage mm -hmm. dollars from different areas. Um, so we'll certainly get those questions, those answers to you. Thank you. And hang on, so that, will that also be covered in when we talk about the executive offices or the office of the mayors? And, um, we, we can include that yeah. as a focus area if that's helpful. Yeah. So would. We, you'll get a second bite of the apple there as well. Thank you. Um, the new investments in 301 technology, um, well, I'm glad to hear that we're talking about exploring that with different tech companies. Um, does this include incorporating a closed loop system rather than just what we have now, which is open and enclosed? An actual step by step of departments being uh, that is going through to keep from a duplication of efforts and for better transparency? We're doing a few things. So I think if you take uh, 311 in terms of people, process, and systems and structures, mm -hmm. on the people side, we've gotten the wage increases so we can have con continuity and not so much turnover because that impacts that service delivery. And then as it relates to process, we are looking at our process maps and also the type of 
um, customers or constituents that call 911 because if you're uh, Mrs. Jones who's 88, you might have a different needs than say a younger person that wants to just do a QR code and be able to pay something. So we're looking at also who are the people that we serve and how they interact with our systems and what the volume is. So as you talked about categories, mm -hmm. you know, if it's X percent of courts, then what are the, the you know top five answers that people are asking for and how do you make that easily available to folks? So we're looking at that process of how we provide information, how we track information, how we coordinate across departments, as well as how we respond to the constituents. So that piece is happening. And then the technology piece is what's the functionality that can happen into our, in our software that makes it really easy to do business or get answers to you quickly. Mm -hmm. And so we are actually currently evaluating, we have a team that's evaluating some different software solutions to okay. see how it can be um, very easy for you to report something, to get information, and also to track where it is in the system. So one of the issues we get is it's opened and then it gets transferred to department and then it says it's closed but then it's still open because the department has opened a ticket but to the person using the service they just want to know that you're working on it and they want to know where it is as status so we're trying to close that out so on the outside I would know this is my ticket this is where it is if I need to get information this is who I call and these are the steps in the process so we're working on that um, it's it's going to take us some time to get it together, but this is one you mean of our you can't top make it priorities. Tomorrow, it sounds simple. Yesterday, I think yesterday. <laughs> um, that's good to hear, and I, I'm, I was excited to hear that we're also shifting over lower level crimes from 911 to 311, such as like public indecency and things of that nature. So this will also include, I'm guessing, working towards a 24/7. I think as we look at our pre-diversion activities and, and standing up the diversion center, mm -hmm. then there will be a natural shift. But we want to make sure as we, you know, sure. identify what the what that workload is and what that looks like, that we're being fair to both departments since they both, you know, have different issues. And especially the 911 fund, we want to make sure we're using that appropriately. But yes, it is high on our priorities to make sure we understand that balance. Thank you, and I promise I'll wrap my questions in the next hour, but my <laughs> next one was the youth employment and engagement um, in green spaces. I know that these are two big initiatives for the administration, and something I would hope that we would look at is doing similar to what LA County did during their incredible presentation they did during our Parks and Green Spaces conference where they are the largest employer of youth in the country. And I'm hoping that the administration could, and council could look towards creating a program within the Parks Department of doing an equity assessment or a vulnerability assessment of our parks and creating an employment program of youth around our parks, especially the parks that rank the lowest on that equitable list or on that resource list, if that makes sense. Um, understood. There's a, a significant initiative on youth. As you know, we have a goal of um, hiring 3,000 youth this mm -hmm. year um, in our across our city and so certainly we'll be looking at opportunities to how we leverage those youth and train them and give them you know opportunities and um, as well as you know benefit to us benefit to them and to the employers in our in our city and thank you um, increasing affordable housing and economic mobility one of the things I was curious about as I've been delving into our process and can been doing uh, close and cleans and uh, demolitions and such is will the city be moving on or continuing I believe what the last administration started on foreclosing on those properties so that we can add them to our land bank and convert that into more affordable housing yeah sure that's a very good question I think when we come back here with invest Atlanta we'll have a lot more detail to, to discuss there but there is there's a process in which those foreclosures are going through uh, the land bank and then being transferred to invest Atlanta for uh, affordable housing opportunities and they can drill further down into uh, the process and how many units have uh, converted to their uh, stewardship right now um, so we'd be happy to have that discussion at that time um, more robustly. Uh, I'm really glad to hear that. And in terms of reducing homelessness, um, real quick, there is both, when it comes to homelessness, we have both sheltered and unsheltered people who are homeless. So I wanted to be careful about the phrasing of that bullet point because you have people that are obviously living in their cars or under bridges in addition to staying in shelters, um, which is never consistent. So still unsheltered. And... Um, I am wondering if 
the dollars that are being put into paying, I've noticed there was a lot of o overtime with some of the CO officers still at ACDC, and as we're looking to convert one of those floors into a diversion center, and it seems like there's a lot of overtime being put into that facility that I thought could be diverted away. One, I don't understand why, but two, if those funds could be diverted away to invest in more pre-diversion tactics like low barrier to no barrier housing, walk-in centers around the city, um, Atlanta Harm Reduction Coalition just opened up one of their facilities, partnering them with them to expand their services. Uh, I believe we're finally moving in a direction to take needles off of the paraphernalia list. There's so many things that we could do. And I think our, our, for example, our APD HOPE team only has about one or two officers left with it, and that's specifically meant to reach out to encampments. So I'm wondering if some of those funds can be moved into more pre-diversion tactics, which would inevitably end up actually saving us money. I, I think in terms of... Um ACDC, when they come, we can have a more detailed conversation mm -hmm. about how their their overtime is allocated and when it's allocated, but I'm not necessarily sure that there's, there are requirements uh, for them to maintain um, their facility in terms of number of staff and like with all turnover and those types of issues, they're managing that overtime, so they always have to have a certain amount of staff there. So I'm not sure, even if there's savings, that they would go to pre-diversion activities. I would say there's going to be significant investment in those activities to make sure they are funded. And then there's um, the appropriate level of investment in um, Department of Corrections. But certainly, we have to make sure there's adequate staffing. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be my... Yeah, and I was going to say that outside of the the budget that's ahead of you too. There's been significant resources that have been put towards homelessness during uh, the um, American Rescue Plan dollars, as well as funding that was put to address uh, emergency rental assistance, mm -hmm. uh, uh, ERA funding. Uh, in fact, we should have some good news coming up before you soon with a piece of legislation for some reallocation of ERA funding from the state level to the city of Atlanta. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're looking forward to continuing to have that dialogue, but it's it's a more kind of robust initiative that's that requires aid and assistance outside of the general fund budget that you'll see in front of you today. Okay. Um, and in terms of the public safety recruitment, are we also considering investing in a co-responder program? Actually, in terms of our investments in um, pre-diversion um, activities, we're looking at what are other components that they can add to their program mm -hmm. that will allow um, there to be that balance. So okay. that, that is, um, again, I, I think we want to make sure we're investing in both areas in an adequate way mm -hmm. so that um, we can have that balanced and, and safe, secure policy for folks. So the pathway, if people can be diverted, um, we prefer that. Mm -hmm. But if they need enforcement, we, we also have that as well. So we, I think we need both. Okay. No, I think I'm... It seems we're shifting public safety in the conversation of a more holistic lens, so I'm happy to hear that. Um, and I guess my, finally my last question, uh, the hiring and retention of the labor market, as we're talking about, to my point earlier, CFO Bali, you addressed of shifting the, those properties that have been demolished or that we have liens on from doing closing cleans or demolitions and moving those, foreclosing those to add to the land bank. I would hope that we would kind of mimic that of what APF is doing around affordable first responder housing and do something similar with our city staff, given that I think that if we did a survey now of how many people lived in the city that worked for DPW, Watershed, other departments, we would find the majority of them can no longer afford to live within the city limits, which I'm sure is adding to our attrition rates and, as, as I'm sure, is also driving up cost of living because people can't afford to live here anymore. So um, I would hope that we would make that a priority as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Baxiari. Um, Councilmember Winston, followed by Councilmember Dozier. Thank you. And just kind of just piggybacking off of Councilmember Baxiari's last point about affordable housing, I know that that's something that's a big key initiative for the mayor and happy to see CEO Gordon. That is also something that you're passionate about. I'm curious to see, you know, where in the budget are we seeing, you know, any type of investment to really kind of lean in on that crisis? And also keeping in mind that, you know, not all of our, you know, affordable houses crisis is around people that are homeowners, that we have a significant amount of people in the city that are renters, um, that, you know, we also need to try to make an investment in them as well. So I'm just curious to know, you know, are, are, are we seeing that in the budget? Are, are we looking at other ways to be able to partner with organizations to help us, you know, address those concerns? 
Um, I think the mayor has talked about the housing strike force, and there's a number of um, issues that we're reviewing at this time. So I think when we have the executive budget, we can drill down into that a little bit more because there will be some um, investments in that budget that reflect um, how we want to address um, strategically um, housing and affordable housing. And I think that's one of those areas where it will be different investment activities. So you have Invest in Atlanta, where they have down payment assistance. You have the um, different funds. So you, that's probably one of those things where it's across, it's across the government. It's not just in one specific area. Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, C.O. Gordon. To address affordable housing kind of robustly, it needs to be done multi-pronged, and we need to leverage dollars um, that are available to the city in, in many different capacities. I'll wear my CFO hat here for a second, but, um, you know, when we're constructing a operational budget for the city of Atlanta, the, the primary uh, objective, of course, is to meet our service delivery for the city and, and uh and make sure that we are funding the, the critical operations of the city. Uh, and affordable housing being a key issue, we can be creative and thoughtful in how we address uh, affordable housing, how we fund affordable housing. Uh, as you guys know, in the past, we've uh, underwrote uh, a housing uh, uh, opportunity uh, bond, a drawdown bond that still has some capacity in it. Um, there's other mechanisms that we have used to address uh, affordability in the city of Atlanta and we continue to look at those mechanisms to address the affordable housing issue for the city of Atlanta. Thank you. Look forward to working with you all on those initiatives. So thank you. All right. And Council Member Dozier. I just, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a quick clarifying question around investment in, in infrastructure. Uh, what is being described by that? Is that like speed tables and maintenance of existing facilities? Is that new capital projects. I'm curious what's described there and also uh, for that larger vision, how is the administration looking to prioritize those sorts of expenditures? So um, again, with, with the investments in, in infrastructure, there is uh, dollars in the operational budget to address repair, maintenance need at uh, some of our public safety uh, facilities. But again, last year, as you guys know, we uh, closed on a $4 million baby bond that was all used to address infrastructure needs. We have a proposal in front of uh, the constituents this year for an infrastructure package that will further address and help us uh, um, 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 build new facilities, uh, take care of some of the deferred maintenance that has happened over the years, and we again continue to utilize the operational budget as well as financing mechanisms in place to really invest into the capital infrastructure of the city of Atlanta. And we be happy to kind of send that back your way and break down which of the last uh, financing vehicles and how they were utilized and they're uh, expected to be utilized. And also um, we can parse out parts of the infrastructure bond package that is really tied to DEEM and facility improvement as well. Thank you. And one of the reasons why I asked about that is just thinking through every transportation and full council meeting that we've had since I've been on board. I see a lot of requests from colleagues around traffic calming, around four-way stops and that sort of stuff. And uh, considering there's a high demand for that, I was just just curious if that was was reflected on that line item. Yeah, th th so there's there's some of that that's in ADOT's uh, budget right now. But also, remember, there's... Um, uh, uh, still funding available from TSPLOS 1.0 mm -hmm. that we utilize to address a lot of those needs as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd be happy to sit down and, and go into more detail and show you the different um, um, funding categories uh, for those, those initiatives. Because okay. they're not all funded in the general fund. I understood. And um, I know as a city we've gotten a lot of federal and state dollars and grant dollars to support uh, green infrastructure projects. I know in southeast Atlanta you have permeable pavers. There's been a lot of work around retention ponds and bioswells. Um, is there an opportunity to expand on those sorts of projects through the general fund or would that have to be a separate financing stream to support an extension of that across the city? Well, it's a very good question. It's uh, a, a part of 
my prior role was to fund those specific projects in Watershed. So Watershed really takes a lead on utilizing green infrastructure uh, as a as as a mechanism to address um, their needs. So the permit papers you're talking about that was actually a Department of Watershed project out in People's Town. Um, we've also, in, uh, the, the, again, a hats off to the Department of, of Watershed Management, but there was an environmental impact bond that was done, and that was all utilized to fund green infrastructure, as well as um, their uh, a 10 percent of the municipal option sales tax for the Department of Watershed Management that is used to address localized fl flooding, and many of the practices used to, to address that stormwater runoff is green infrastructure type projects. So. You know, we'll be happy to again sit down and, and go in detail about uh, the different funding mechanisms for green infrastructure. All right, and we've been joined by Councilmember Michael Bond. Um, any other questions um, for COO Gordon on this section? Okay, um, we'll continue on to revenues then. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Members. I'm Lawrence Davis, Jr. I serve as the Revenue Chief for the Office of Revenue. On the slide presented before you is just a list of our agencies, institutions, and businesses that the Office of Revenue utilizes to review various model, revenue models as well as analyze the uh, economic trends and historical data that helps us to construct the annual budget and develop the five-year forecast plan. On the next slide, this slide illustrates our top major revenue categories that contribute to the revenue uh, assumptions incorporated into the FY23 budget. As you can see, the property tax serves as our largest revenue contributor at 33% of the budget, of the proposed budget, and has exhibited stable growth throughout the pandemic and we are expecting it to continue to increase due to the rising property values from the market price demands and new constructions. Our second uh, largest revenue source on the chart is at 18% is the local option sales tax, and this correlates with the consumer spending and is a major component of the city's economic recovery following the, peer, following the peak period of the pandemic. Our next revenue category and major contributor is the public utilities, alcohol, beverage, and tax. And this is projected to make up about 17% of the proposed budget. This is due to the spike in the tax avalon tax taxes and the alcohol by the drink tax. And our final uh, major revenue contributor on this slide uh, coming in at 16% is license and permits. License and permits uh, revenue in FY23 are projected to normalize, as well as we are seeing that the building permit revenue is projected to remain stable and correlate with the real estate market. On the next slide, this slide before you illustrates the four components associated with the taxable property value. The first chart um, titled taxable assessed value is basically shows you the taxable assessed value growth since FY20, I mean, excuse me, since FY18. And the totals in each uh, fiscal year uh, present comprise of the three property uh, the three property taxes, which are residential, commercial, and others. And on this particular chart, others is made up of industrial properties, historical properties, mobile homes, mo uh, motor vehicles, and public utility property tax. As you can see in FY18, the, uh, the total was $26.7 billion. And this consists of 12.6 billion in residential, 13.3 billion in commercial, and 8 million in others. For FY19, the total of 32.4 billion consists of 17 billion in residential, 
14.6 billion in commercial and 8 billion and 8 million, excuse me, in others. For FY20, it consists of 17.6 billion for residential, 15.2 billion for commercial and 8 million for others. In FY21, this uh, total consists of 18.7 billion in residential, 15.5 billion in commercial, and 7 million in others. And then for the final category for FY22, it consists of 20.3 billion in residential, 15.9 billion in commercial, and 1.1 billion in others. The second chart labeled actual tax collected just shows the increase in tax collected during the FY23 to the FY22, and in this coincides with the increase in the property value. Our third chart uh, titled, titled uh, tax based by land use shows the bulk of our tax base derived from residential and commercial properties, which makes up 95% of the land use. The next category is others, which makes up roughly 3%. And this comprise of motor vehicle, mobile homes, historical properties, and public utilities. And our final category on this chart is at 2.1% of land use is industrial. The last chart title operating millage rate shows the general operating tax levy from FY18 to FY22 and it has remained at 7.85 mills since FY19. This is a result of two pieces of legislation that was passed in 1999. The first one being the uh, Senate Bill 177 also known as the Tax Bill of Rights which is a provision of indirect tax increases resulting from increases to existing property values in the county due to inflation. And the other legislation was House Bill 820, in which this passage allows the city of Atlanta to retain 2.6% inflationary growth, as well as new construction growth, without any additional public, public hearing and tax uh, notice requirements. On the next slide. This slide shows the history of growth in property value, general operating levies, current year property tax collection, and dollar value per meals. As you can see in the FY22 row, we are expecting, we are anticipating the property tax collections to be at uh, 233.4 million. Next slide. This slide is basically a comparison of FY21 actuals, FY22 adopted revenue budget, and the FY23 proposed revenue budget of $734.2 million. Our proposed budget of $734.2 million includes $4 million in revenue initiatives that increase the total um, budget that was presented earlier by Dr. Wilson of 300, I mean, sorry, of 730.2 million. Some of those initiatives include the proposed rate adjustment to the watershed pilot, uh, 72 Marietta property lease rate adjustment, and technology enhancement designated for the municipal courts. As outlined in the column listed budget FY23 versus 22, you will see the projected increases in each category except for the other revenues and indirect costs. Other revenues from FY22 and 23 shows a decrease of 60.32 million and reflects the discontinuation of the federal subsidies, which was helpful during the pandemic time. The other revenue category is made up of sales of assets, investment earnings, and miscellaneous revenues. And the second area, as stated, is indirect costs. 
and this shows a decrease in the budget for FY23 by uh, 400.96 million. And this is budgeted conservatively due to the uncertainties regarding the changes in the chargeback rates in the upcoming indirect cost plan. On the next slide, this slide is basically outlining, um, I'm sorry, is basically comparing in percentage the budget for, for FY22 adopted revenue and the FY23 proposed budget. As you can see um, from the percentages, many of our revenue categories will either increase or remain flat in the proposed FY23 budget, except for the areas that I spoke of earlier, the um, other revenues and the indirect costs. And this concludes the report. Questions from my colleagues. Uh, Councilmember Dozier. I just had a quick question about the millage rate. I know we've had a static millage rate for the last few years. Uh, was that? The last decade? No, it was like the last four years, I think is what it said on the on the slide. But I was just curious as far as APS, Fulton County, um, well, our millage rate has remained static. What has our... And then when you look at that tax stack, what are, what are those other jurisdictions doing? Are they, I know APS is increased areas, but... Yeah, we, we can uh, provide the different uh, changes for uh, the prospective millage adjustments for Fulton County APS. I, I don't have that in front of me right now, but we can uh, provide it. I know theirs does change annually from uh, year to year, so okay. we, we can provide that to you. And I guess my larger question is... is I know it's a very politically contentious topic, but is that something that was taken into consideration as far as meeting some of these general fund goals um, with this budget? And would that be something that would be considered for future budgets, recognizing that we've been static for the last few years? Yeah, I mean, with, with our proposed budget this year, that was not contemplated uh, to do any adjustments to, to taxes. We feel that 7.85 is sufficient to meet the, the city's needs. Um, one of the, you know, considerations is w when constructing a budget, we want to make sure that it's, it's fair, it's equitable, and not burdensome to homeowners as well, too. So it's something that, you know, would be, considered probably if it's needed, but the 7.8 is sufficient to meet our operational commitments. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Bond. Just a point of information for our freshman colleague. We have not adjusted our millage rate up here at the City of Atlanta since 2009. So we've had 12 years of balanced budgets based on the current uh, millage rate. Okay, I misread the slide. I appreciate the clarification. Um, I, yeah, Ms. Norwood, and I have a question. I just want to add that it's because the property values have gone up so incredibly that people are paying lots more in property taxes so we don't have to adjust the millage because property, the pro sales of, of adjacent properties have skyrocketed neighbors who have not sold and who may have a house that is not assessed in a way, and that's not their fault, but it is a system that we've been able not to adjust the millage because we have absorbed all of those increases and the customer and our citizens are paying that. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're good. What, the button is far away. Um, so one of the questions that keeps coming up in my mind about all this is our commercial property taxes and feeling as though that is not equitable at all and feeling that a lot of our homeowners and renters and other entities have had to absorb the cost that we are not putting upon commercial properties, which are, uh, to put it mildly, robbing us, it feels like, of money that could be be making up and make, as to your point, Mr. Bossing, more equitable to make sure that we are that everyone is sacrificing equally it seems that a majority of us are carrying their burden how do we begin to rectify that 
Yeah, I, I think, um, and it was mentioned earlier, it's mentioned by Councilmember Norwood as well, it really is an initiative and a dialogue that we'll need to have with Fulton County Tax Commissioner's Office to make sure that the data makes sense. I mean, we know about 18 percent of the parcels are commercial parcels, and that represents about 48 percent of the collections, but is that the right number? We'll need to dig deeper into that data and validate it. So uh, it'll be a continuing conversation to make sure that those uh, assessments are accurate. Uh, but we, we do hear the concern. Well, there'll be another point within the budget hearings in which we'll be able to discuss that more in depth and create more tangible takeaways and steps forward. So, Councilmember Vex, I mean, it, it, it was one of our um, finance executive committee budget, uh, not budget, but um, just goals and priorities for the year. I think what we need to do, I don't know that it'll come up during the budget because this, that's kind of all set in terms of um, the tax digest and all that, but I think it's an issue that we need to pick up in FEC and then potentially invite the, uh, the tax commissioner to come over and have a conversation with us about, and the, and the assessor's office to come over and have a conversation with us. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Will, uh, Mr. Hillis. Yeah, just you mentioned it, but I just want to correct the tax commissioner doesn't set property right, values. Right. It's assessor, assessor, assessors. Yeah. Commissioner collects it. Um, and, that, and just another correction that was mentioned various times that we have not increased the millage rate for 12, going on 13 years, but we have not only not increased it, we have rolled it back multiple years. So um, in comparison to our other two taxing government colleagues. Um, I do have a question about the, the sequencing of all this because it struck me, I mean, in, in the um, narrative here, we talk about a, kind of an estimated 6% increase in property values. Um, remind me again when the assessment letters go out by the county, when that appeal process is, I do remember five, six, seven years ago, we got gummed up over here because there were so many appeals that it delayed our process. And there is another milestone where the assessor's office has to, or someone establishes, certifies the value of the tax digest before we can then move forward. So if someone can walk me through that and just what the key timing is and where we might be at risk if yeah, we've, we've read the reports about home values jumping up so high. Ms. Norwood also just referred to it. I suspect if the assessor's office isn't realistic about it, that we're probably going to, going to see yet another wave of appeals. So if someone could just walk me through that. So the, the tax bills will typically go out um, around June or July uh, once, they've, once they once their boards have met and finalized it because we mm -hmm. have to wait on the... Um, uh, Fulton County Library and APS, so their boards to meet. Um, so those bills go out in June or July, and then there's a 45-day uh, appeal time period for people to come back and say they disagree um, there, thereafter. So we will get a final, uh, so they issue a preliminary tax digest, and then we get a final tax digest in September, which is adopted at state level. So. That's kind of how the, the timeline plays okay. out. Okay. All right. So it, it won't. We don't wait for their certification for our for us to establish our millage rate. Right. Um, but should there be any significant variance in September, um, then we would react at that point. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Hills. I, I wasn't going to bring up the elephant in the room, and don't want to get too deep into this, but. One of the three proposals for the solid waste rate fix is to include mm -hmm. common right. good services that benefit everyone, and not just taxpayers, but visitors to the city of Atlanta, keeping our waste clean, et cetera, special events, into the general fund. So what is the analysis and the timeline of when that would have to be approved, plus what would be the millage rate adjustment if we had to? Because, I mean, there are already staying uh, and you're paying it, you know, it's just moving it to somewhere that is more, you know, I guess legal. Sure. Um, so what, um, where are we at there? Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll hit the high levels knowing that we have a work session on yeah, I don't want to get too deep into that. I don't want to get too to deep into, into the weeds here. But the um, common good services to perform 
have been assessed and, 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 and estimated to generally cost about $20 million to deliver on behalf of the city. So if you were to look at that $20 million uh, need from the Department of, of, of Solid Waste Services, the current value of a mill is about $30 million for each mill. So uh, if you did the math, it's roughly about 0.66 mills that would cover that $20 million uh, need for the Department of Solid Waste Services. Um, that's kind of the, the mathematical answer to the, that you asked. The second component to what you asked is the timing perspective of this. So knowing we have a budget to pass by June 30th, um, we the timeline contemplates the approval of an option by council by that date so that we can have you know time before the before the budget to be able to amend the anticipations and appropriations of the solid waste fund accordingly that will be um, directed by whichever uh, legislation is approved or not approved by city council so right now the proposed budget for solid waste is the current uh, solid waste rate structure um, because we don't have an ordinance in front of us that directs us to do something else. Until we have that, then we will change the, the process accordingly. And again, you know, there's a work session on next Thursday, and we'd love to utilize that time to dig deep into the different options and how they uh, impact the different customer categories. To, to be continued May 12th at 10 a.m. in committee room one. <laughs> last thing for that, um, please give real life examples. I'd like to know what somebody who pays $5,000 in property taxes, $200 in property taxes, $20,000 in property taxes, and you know they go up from there. So I'd like to know in each of those scenarios what different levels of home, um, of citizens, uh, property tax bill is going, how it's going to be affected with each of those scenarios. Thank you. Bring your popcorn next Thursday. All right. Um, any other questions on the revenue side? Okay. Let's go ahead and move into the expenditures uh, piece of the presentation. Go ahead. Good afternoon. How about now? Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound like it's on. Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, good afternoon again. My name is Charles Bell, Budget Chief in the Office of Budget and Fiscal Policy. Um, before you, you will see the uh, pie chart, and I guess I'd be remiss if I did not start off by talking about the overall size of the city's operating budget. It sits at $2.28 billion. Uh, that is the largest that the city has ever seen to date. The pie chart there before you uh, highlights four major segments of the city uh, from a financial aspect. The general fund sits at uh, $734.2 million, representing 32.2% of the overall $2.28 billion. Uh, segments of the general fund are highlighted on, I think, page 55 of your proposed budget book. The general fund includes 23 departments and or agencies. Included but not limited to in the general fund are eight departments. Uh, the first three, police, fire, and corrections, it sit at 235.7. 106.9 and 16.1 million dollars respectively. Collectively they make up 358.76 million and they represent public safety uh, which sits at about 48.9 percent. The others that I spoke of when I said eight, uh, transportation, parks and rec, Atlanta information management, city planning and non-departmental. Uh, these are the five that go with the first three. This subset of eight equals $611.01 million, representing 83.2% of the general fund. 
Aviation sits at 523.6, and the Water Department sits at 610.1. Collectively, they are 23% and 26.8% respectively, and they make up the other portion that gets you right at about 100%. There are seven remaining funds that are included in the other funds category. Uh, these funds are group insurance, solid waste services revenue fund, hotel and motel tax fund, I'm sorry, hotel and motel tax fund, fleet service fund, emergency 911, rental and uh, motor vehicle tax fund, and the city plaza operating fund. Collectively, they total $409.4 million, which you see on the pie, and uh, that gets us to just, about, just under 18%. If you go to the next slide, uh, expense, cat uh, expense comparison by major account group. Um, here we're looking at a slide that highlights the FY22 adopted budget as about $710 million and the FY23 proposed budget at $734.2. The gap represents a $24.2 million increase. We break down the variance by charting the accounting categories. 67.4% of the increase is attributable, attributable to personnel expenses. Personnel expenses will increase about $16.3 million, and 91% of that increase is attributable to the four-year agreement for raises uh, in pay for fire and recent legislation that passed for pay increases for corrections. There are also about $19.8 million of mayoral initiatives, and they uh, also include pay increases for 311, AIM, ADOT, parks and additional positions uh, for police and fire. Purchased contract services has decreased about $2.8 million, primarily due to decreases in uh, contracts throughout. The variance in the supplies budget is negligible with a decrease of only $154,000. Capital outlays are holding steady with basically no change, moving only about $279,000. And then we have interfund interdepartmental charges. Uh, which we will experience about a $1.9 million decrease in the cost, estimated cost of our repair and maintenance of the uh, city's fleet. With respect to other costs, we are looking to optimize our post-employment benefits such that we'll be more efficient expecting to reduce costs. Debt service costs are scheduled to decline some one point. $96 million based on the timing and change in the principal and interest schedules. Uh, there is an uptick in our conversion summary category. The reserve account will increase about $3.5 million, and the finance department uh, has made a conscientious effort to improve the balance in the reserve account. The appropriations for other financing uses will experience an uptick of roughly $15.3 million, basically due to activity requiring operating transfers, and uh, the, the lot of that falls in the Department of Transportation. As we look, turn our attention to the next slide, here you will see uh, a slide that is reminiscent of uh, what Chief Davis just showed in the uh, revenue category. We're comparing the FY22 adopted budget to the FY23 proposed budget. Uh, as you look to see the percentage of the total for each account group. Similarly, you'll see personnel 466 in FY22 and 482 in uh, the FY23 proposed budget. They both sit at 65.7% of the total. Um, I can't remember how many years back, but it's been a, a bundle where we're looking at two-thirds of our general fund budget being um, that of personnel services. Don't see too many other variations uh, as you go down the line there with the exception of other financing uses. Uh, we've got a movement of about $15 million, and uh, basically that's due to transfer outs to um, 
accounting term where we're properly classifying activity. Uh, the bulk of that will come from what uh, ADOT will be doing during the course of the year as it's kind of project related. As we turn our attention to the next slide, expenditure uh, comparisons by department. This slide compares the FY22 budget to the FY23 proposed budget while also listing the expenses by department from uh, fiscal year 2021. So those dollars are actual dollars while FY22 is a adopted budget and FY23 is proposed. The current year's budget reflects an increase of about 3.51 million uh, versus actuals from fiscal year 2021. When comparing the FY22 adopted budget at 710.03 uh, to the FY23 budget of 734.2, we will find a margin of increase of $24.2 million. The largest variance illustrated on the slide in large part highlights the greatest, uh, I should say the greater investment in public service. So the police budget is scheduled to grow $4.36 million, fire at $2.6 million, and corrections at two point twelve, million. And uh, they represent 37.6% of the $24.17 million budget increase. The budget for executive offices will increase $2.14 million as it will absorb a security uh, contract um, a security and janitorial contract previously managed by Dean, that being Enterprise Asset Management, whose budget on the flip side will decrease as a result of the transfer. The Department of Transportation is the only other department with recognizable movement, that being the $5.06 million increase. This is primarily due to the department's increase in personnel expenses. We can turn our attention to the next slide, which is a non-departmental comparison. This, this slide provides an overview of the general fund's non-departmental budget. The non-departmental budget provides funding for various expenditures that are not gener generally uh, paralleled with specific or specific to a single department. The proposed budget, again, is $94.2 million when comparing FY23 to FY22. As I previously mentioned uh, earlier, with the increase of $3.12 million. Non-departmental can be categorized, as you see there on the pie, five in five different categories. Debt service at $33.2 million. Uh, other post-employment benefits sits at $22.1 million. Payments to other governments at $8.6 million. And uh, included in that as a snapshot, uh, we talk about DeKalb and Fulton County payments, Fulton County Animal Control, Fire Department and Watershed Memorandum of Understandings, and then business license refunds. And a uh, the, the lot of those pretty much make up that $8.6 million. Uh, we do have some other smaller things in there, and election expenses are one of those. Again, the restricted reserves um, up uh, a little bit this year, $5 million. We're, we feel very good about that, uh, especially when you compare it to last year when we started out with only $1.4 million. And then we have a, a locale of what we refer to as all other. It's at $25.2 million. The type activities that sit in the all other would include litigation, where we're paying uh, DOJ items, uh, invest, invest Atlanta, insurance expense and risk management, uh, water utility for Grady Hospital. We have an agreement there, uh, and business license refunds, and we have smattering of a few other smaller items. That pretty much uh, covers that pie. All right, before we move on, questions. Councilmember Member Street, did you have a question in this section? No. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, we'll continue forward. Thank you, sir. And having said that, I'll turn it over to one of my deputy CFOs, Ms. Yolanda Carr. Ms. Thank Carr. you. We're on page 45. I wanted to talk on page 47, 
I wanted to talk about the trust funds. So we have the trust funds that we manage here in the finance department. We have a total of 186 trust funds, and I'll highlight some of those trust funds. We talked a lot about affordable housing today. CFO Bala mentioned, as well as COO Gordon mentioned affordable housing. And so we have an account of 20 million for affordable housing. We also have a tree trust fund of 11 million. And this is really where we um, have amounts that we collect when builders come into the community to remove trees. And I don't know if that's an echo. Is that an echo that's here? Okay. All right. Thank you. We also have the insurance rebate account, and this is where we collect from different insurance couriers to determine exactly how much we're going to get a rebate for, and this is utilized at the wellness center across the street. We also have the care and conserve trust fund, and this is where we collect water and wastewater. Um, I'm sorry, this is where we collect um, the amount to determine if someone has a um, hardship with paying their water bills. So we have that collection here. Thank you, Damon. Is that better? Okay, thank you. We also have the shelter and vaccination campaign. This is where we have set aside a certain amount for individuals that are homeless. We have a total there of 3.8 million. We also have the technology surcharge. This is an amount that's collected when we have builders that come in. We have a fee that we include as a part of that permit. We also have the federal RICO treasury of 1.8 million and this is managed by the Department of Police, and this is where we have an amount that's set aside um, as a result of when you have um, individuals that seize funds or different activities within that fund. I'll move to the next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna change that. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna get it right here. How's that? Okay, great, thank you. So I wanted to talk a little bit about impact fees. So I wanna start talking about what are impact fees. So when we look at impact fees, impact fees are a fee that is collected when we have builders that come into the community. Um, they have to pay a certain amount. And so with that, that's just the result of new construction in the community, whether we're building parks, uh, whether we're building fire stations or different things within the community that has an impact. So on this particular slide, you'll see we have transportation. Um, we have the restricted amount of 26 million. We also have the unrestricted amount of 12 million. And we have it by different categories for transportation. We also have transportation north, transportation west and south. And so we adopted an ordinance last year to make sure that we updated the impact fees. And so you'll see the breakout for the impact fees where we have the transportation north, west, and south. We also have parks north and parks south and west, as well as police and fire. So these are the different components that we have for impact fees. Next slide, please. Hold on a second, before you move on with that, sure. I think we have some questions about impact fees. So Ms. Sure. Norwood. Yes, I'm aware that we changed from a citywide transportation impact fee to north, south, and west. Um, so it seems in Congress to me that we would still have this much money, uh, both in restricted and unrestricted, unencumbered impact fees that are that are characterized as citywide. There, we ought to be able to go to where those different impact fees were collected, uh, even though we. I understand how it works, but. I would like to see when we delve into this that we know where all those impact fees originated from and that we're following the ordinance and separating those out as to whether or not they were collected north, whether they were collected south, or whether they were collected west. Um, very good point, Councilmember Norwood. So working in conjunction with the Department of Planning, so when the ordinance was adopted, of course, we had to break out the different entities, um, the different locations, and so they are looking into that. But when, you know, they first started down this path, everything was put in one account for transportation citywide. So we are aware of that, and we are working with planning to determine how to break that out. 
Earth. Right, and I understand. I was here. I was down here in the 1990s when that decision was made yes. that for the good of the city, we had to have it be one impact fee area. Yes, um, we have changed a lot since the 1990s, and it makes sense that those parts of the city that are getting the impact um, from the development would get the um, corresponding um, impact fees to assuage that development. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. The questions on this topic before we move to the fund balance. Okay, thank you. So in this slide, fund balance, um, we've grown fund balance over the years, starting with FY12 compared to FY21. And so when we look at fund balance, we've grown since 2013. But I want to start with FY17. We have a fund balance of $200 million, and that is a result of us moving the building permit fund back into the general fund, so you'll notice that. We have a decrease in FY18, and really this is when we had the cyber attack. So we had unanticipated expenses at that time, so we had a decrease in fund balance. In FY19, fund balance increased again. Of course, we talked a little bit about property taxes increasing over time, and so we saw that as a result of our fund balance. In FY20, we had the pandemic, and so we had fund balance at $186 million, but then also the next year, we had fund balance back at $187 million, and this is due to funding that we received from ARP. So this is the supplement that we received from the federal government. So overall, we have a policy for fund balance. We like to keep fund balance at a level that is is above the 25%, but we also have a range of 15 to 20%. Um, with fund balance, most of the time, we like to have three months of expenses on hand. We have well above that for the city of Atlanta. So we're in a really good position as it relates to fund balance. So I just wanted to share that. So that's the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions, or I turn it over to Deputy Wilson. Any questions on the fund balance slides? Okay, let's keep moving. Move to uh, slide 53. We'll start talking about the uh, debt and investment portfolios. Thank you. Um, so you'll see in front of you the investment portfolio overview. Uh, we are guided by state statutes and the city's investment policies. Our objectives are safety or the preservation preservation of value, liquidity, having access to funds when needed, and lastly, yield. Uh, so our first priority is really to uh, safeguard assets. Based on these objectives, the city's investments are in high quality and liquid investments, 33% in U.S. agencies, 28% in municipal bonds, 23% in the Georgia Fund 1, and 16% in U.S. Treasuries. Consequently, the yields generated by the portfolio are relatively low, uh, showing year-to-date third quarter returns for the past three years of 1.8%, 0.8%. 8.88% and 0.92% respectively. With interest rising in the current market, we expect these investment returns in the coming quarters will begin to rise. Next slide. On the debt side, we manage approximately $6.3 billion of the city's debt issued for a variety of purposes, 47% for water and wastewater, which is the largest share. 39% for the airport, and smaller amounts for general obligation, general fund, and the TADs. We constantly monitor the city's debt portfolio for refinancing opportunities, uh, which in FY22 netted a, uh, generated a NPV savings of over $136 million. Next slide. And you'll see here are uh, Atlanta's credit ratings across a, a number of our um, issuances with high ratings across the board for GO bonds and debt issued by our enterprises. Uh, the rating agencies recognize Atlanta's fiscal conservatism, low debt relative to other similar cities, and strong financial management. 
And that concludes our then investment section. Um, Ms. Overstreet. Uh, microphone. Microphone. Thank you, Chair Juan. Um, on that particular slide, I'm looking for a year. Is that 2022, FY 2022, or? That's as of today. So it's the most current. The most, this is yeah, just the most is, current. Yeah, so this is a snapshot in time, and we usually do it as of the day of. So these are today's ratings. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. I'm going to piggyback on that. When when would be the next opportunity to um, ask the rating agencies to revisit this? Um, I mean, I feel like since we're coming out of the pandemic, um, I don't know if it's after we adopt a budget that then you know gives us reason uh, to to make a case. Uh, is that the right? Yeah, that's a that's very good thing? question. Um, and it's you know opportune right now. We're actually in the market for the airport credit, and we meet with the rating agencies next week, I believe. And so we'll we'll have some strong uh, conversations regarding uh, Hartsfield Jackson's ability to to rebound during the pandemic and regain his status as the world's busiest airport. Um, you know that sector across the board was 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 downgraded during the pandemic. So we'll hope to see some movement there in the recovery. And we'll, we'll continue to make a strong case. They might want some more, some more traction, but we'll keep on having those conversations. But every time we go with a with a bond issuance or a debt issuance, we advocate uh, for Atlanta's uh, different credits, and uh, they've continued to grow over the years, both on general fund and uh, water and wastewater continues to be um, um, a strong credit too, as well as airport. It's part of me that wonders if you time that just that we be on our best behavior during the budget hearings, but. Um, Mr. Winston. Yeah, so it's been pretty widely known that uh, the feds would raise interest rates due to the, you know, the high increase of inflation that's happening right now. Um, right now, just looking at the portfolio yield, um, what are we looking or projecting for 2023 in terms of our yield? We're looking at it remaining flat, and how does that overall impact our, our investment strategy there? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So we um, do anticipate to pick up yield based on interest rate increases. Um, we will probably uh, start to inch back over the one and a quarter uh, range by this time next year. So as our investments mature, our investments tend to be shorter on the uh, on on uh, in the curve. So we're one to three years out. So as those mature, we'll have opportunities to reinvest at the higher rates, incrementally increasing the portfolio's yield. So you'll see, you'll you'll start to see as we present in our quarterly updates, you will start to see that yield continuously uh, tick up. And does that impact uh, the the requirements around liquidity and liquidity in terms of the portfolio? No, we'll still be with the same um, city's investment policy, which guides the direction in how we uh, invest, and that is uh, pursuant to state law and charter as well for uh, for local municipalities. Thank you. Other questions from my colleagues. Okay. If not, then um, uh, I appreciate the presentation uh, that y'all gave us. It is a great way of setting up um, uh, the rest of the budget hearing schedule. Just as a reminder, colleagues, tomorrow uh, we will be starting at 10 a.m. with the unions, first AFSME, then PACE, then IAFF, and then IBPO. We'll break for lunch, and then we'll have customer service and uh, enterprise asset management follow. So um, but we'll see everybody uh, bright and early tomorrow morning. Thank you to the Finance Department, and I uh, look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.